and and for me, it comes back to again my interest in engineering and helping people solve problems. I guess that's what puts a smile on my face and helping people innovate and take their manufacturing operations to the next level is fun for me. It's exciting, and I think beyond that, I, I think also like helping drive diversity in the industry. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero episode, and I'm very excited to sit down with Brandon Mendoza, who is the Director of Sales at Odin Technologies. How you doing, Brandon? I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. Now, you're located, for our listeners, you're in Utah, right? I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. Man, all right. Well, go Jazz. Look forward to having this uh, conversation with you, buddy. So get, get us started. We love these conversations to get going just by telling us about your journey to where you're at now. I was born and raised in uh, Mount Vernon, Washington. Grew up in the Northwest there and uh, went to school at Washington State University, go Cougs. Ended up studying uh, mechanical engineering at Washington State. Great experience, great school. And I ended up doing what's called an engineering entrepreneurship program in college. So the idea of that is to encourage starting technology-based businesses. We went down to Silicon Valley. That was startups ranging from 23andMe at the time, which was a five-person company back then, to Tesla, who no one really knew of, and Google, who was already very big at that time. But I, I think that's what first sparked my interest in entrepreneurship, innovation, things like that. I then, out of school, ended up taking a job with Rockwell Automation, and I actually went down a sales engineering track, which might seem surprising for somebody who's studying mechanical engineering in school. But what I came to find out is I love engineering, but I also love working with people. And sales engineering was a way to to combine both of those and really lean on my strengths. And so I found it very exciting. Every day was different, very fast, fast pace as far as the environment and just exciting as far as the number of industries I got to work with. When I was first considering like all folks do, you know, what am I going to go do out of school? I think it's easy to get overwhelmed with, man, there's so many options out there. What do I choose? And for me, I wasn't sure what industry I was most interested in. Being from Seattle area, Boeing and aerospace is big out there. That was something that was an option at the time. Oil and gas was doing really well. So I looked at that, but I also was like, man, what if I got into that and I didn't end up liking it and then I'm stuck in Alaska or stuck geographically or just stuck in that industry in general? And then I got exposed to Rockwell, did an internship in the sales engineering role and realized that they work with every type of manufacturing, whether it's food and beverage, pharmaceuticals, aerospace, medical devices, oil and gas, chemicals, entertainment, automotive, and the list goes on. Basically anything that's, that's made and beyond. So for me, that was just really exciting. I saw it as an opportunity to get exposed to a lot of different industries and technologies. And that's exactly what it was. So I spent about eight years with Rockwell, uh, various roles from a sales engineer to a sales manager. And then I recently left Rockwell to join Odin Technologies, which is a startup that's doing AI software for manufacturing. And I joined them as a director of sales for Odin. And it was right before the pandemic, which is a crazy time to, to join a new company, but in retrospect, I'm glad I did it. It's been a wild ride thus far. I think anytime you go from a 23,000 person company to, to somebody who has less than 100 employees, I think it's definitely a different environment. There's pros and cons to being at a large company versus small. But one of the main differences is the number of hats you're wearing and, and what you're doing on a daily basis and, and the pace of how quickly things are, are changing and moving. And so for me, it's been a challenge and, and an exciting one and excited for what the, the future has in store. Man, that is awesome, and it sounds like it at Odin, pretty cool environment that you're in now. But sp- talk to me just for a second about that sales engineering track you said you were there. So I'm not familiar with that. So does that give you exposure to different areas and different types of roles throughout that period of time? Yeah. So Rockwell in particular does 
like a seven to nine month training program out of school. I actually worked for Rockwell in I think seven different cities across eight years that I was there. And the goal of that is A, to, you know, get you trained on their technology, B, get you trained on different manufacturing customers and use cases and applications, and then C, get you trained on sales as a job. I went to school for engineering and and sales is definitely a very important and powerful skill set. And so that that's the goal of that training program is to get you trained in all three of those areas so that you can go out and really help their customers solve problems by applying their technology. And if you do that well, the sales will follow. Very cool. And it sounds like it gave you some great exposure and opportunities. And you also recognize that you liked working with people. Hats off to you. We're all better off because you took the path you, you're on because having you in all these different types of environments is definitely good for manufacturing. You've seen a lot of things, Brandon, through your experience at Rockwell now to Odin. What are you seeing as some of the greatest challenges that industry has in the coming in the coming years? Yeah, there's definitely a lot. I think COVID exposed quite a bit. As far as vulnerabilities in the industry, I think people quickly realize that, hey, we we need to accelerate our digital transformation. It has to be digital everywhere mindset. I think they realize that they have to be able to shift their operations more quickly, right? Demand is changing at a faster pace and they have to be able to adapt as fast as it's changing. And then also look for, for areas of, again, vulnerabilities where they can be shut down, whether that's cybersecurity concerns or whether that's, hey, we have a global pandemic and we no longer can have all these people in the factory. How do we enable our workforce remotely? So I think that definitely is a big challenge. And I think it's also an opportunity to rebrand. I think when you look at manufacturing, it's an industry that was, I think, pretty sexy if you go back 50, 60 years ago in like the industrial revolution, right? It was what everyone got excited about as far as how many tanks or planes or things that we could build and automobiles. But I think over time, it's lost its attractiveness as far as attracting new young talent because it's not seen as as innovative. And also, when you look at the work environments or even the geographies that manufacturing is in, you're talking about dirty, dangerous environments, maybe in places that people don't want to live. But I think COVID shifted that, right? The manufacturers are offering more remote workforces they're, they're on the leading edge of technology with things like machine learning, augmented reality, all sorts of technologies that are accelerating the pace of change. So I think it's an opportunity to really rebrand themselves and start attracting a lot of that STEM talent that's going through school right now. Yeah, no doubt, man. Absolutely. And speaking about that talent, the people that are coming through school and, and, and thinking about entering industry, you got any advice out there that you'd like to offer up? Yeah, I think people always like to say, if you can align your passions with your career, you won't work a day in your life. I think that's tough to do for a lot of folks and sometimes isn't a viable goal to do that and also make economic sense. But I would say if you can find a way to connect your passion to STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, there's definitely a ton of opportunity out there. Some of those degrees can seem intimidating, but you know, even a person like me that I went down the engineering path, but I know I don't necessarily just want to work with computers. I want to interact with people. There's opportunities to get an advanced degree, but then spend most of your time working more with people. There's options as far as what you can then do with that degree. When I did that Harold Frank entrepreneurship program, that was an exciting opportunity for me to get exposure to Silicon Valley and people that are the core of innovation, the heart of innovation for America. And it was common to see that people got, you know, engineering degrees, but then went into MBAs or more business or people oriented type roles. And so I think that that's a cool combo that can drive a lot of value and happiness if it's something that aligns with your passions. I would encourage folks to get involved in extracurricular activities outside of just your normal schoolwork. For me, that's where I started to understand where my strengths lied as far as leadership and interacting with people and even the, the sales side. I ended up doing like a recruiting role that recruiting role, sorry, that helped me understand that I enjoy the sales side of things. So I think those internships or ext- extracurricular activities can bring as much, if not more, value than the classroom itself. Right. And sometimes you can learn so much more about yourself that you didn't have that opportunity. If you're in STEM all the time and you don't 
take a chance to look around. You may miss something that, that you're really passionate about. So great advice, man. And how about mentors? Anybody that you like to call out that's really helped you along the way to, to build you to where you're at now? Somebody made the quote that you want to look for the bus that has the most change because change creates opportunity and jump on that bus. But you also want to jump on that bus with, with a good mentor, a good manager. And it's amazing how much a manager, a mentor can impact your career. So I think first off, I'd encourage folks to always be building and growing your personal board of directors. No one has success in life on their own. Who can you surround yourself with that you can learn from and share best practices and grow those relationships? For me personally, Nirpal Saihoda was a big one. He was, I think, my third manager into my career and definitely had the, the biggest impact on my career in accelerating things for me. And when I reflect back on why that was, I think number one, it's important for managers to to show that they care for you to feel like they understand you and they actually care about your success. And he was really good at that. But I think number two, I think a key role of a manager or mentor is to challenge you. You often think of managers or mentors as people that you can go to when you have questions or concerns where you need help. And I think it's easy to just sometimes go straight to the answer and, and provide what that person is looking for. Sometimes that limits their growth. And so I think Nepal did a really good job of challenging me and maybe not always just giving me the answer, but pointing me in the direction and then challenging me to, to potentially go figure it out on my own to a certain extent. Not that he didn't have the answer or he didn't provide answers at times, but that nature of, of challenging me, I think, helped me grow, grow faster and really get me you know, outside of my comfort zone. That's awesome. I want to go back just for one second. You said always be working on your personal board of directors. I, I haven't heard it put that way. That was awesome, man. Yeah. Just like a company, right? Every company has a board of directors to, to help steer the ship and give them guidance. And I, I don't see why you can't take that that macro use case and apply it to you individually and, and think about your own board of directors. If I heard a lot of people talk about you are a, a clear reflection of the people and experiences that you surround yourself with. And so I think deciding who and what you want to be and, and thinking about who you should have on that board of directors to influence you towards that is, is pretty important. No doubt. I love it, man. It was, that was great. That was one, of, one of the best I, I've heard for sure. And a lot of times you're in industry in a lot of different areas of within industry and manufacturing. A lot of people have myths you know, or, or perceptions about what we do, for instance. If you had a chance to debunk something here, what would that be? Yeah, I think I talked a little bit about it earlier, so I don't want to be too redundant here, but I do think there's this myth that manufacturing is like not exciting. I think it's a it's lost its sexiness and it's a hidden industry as well, right? Like it's B two B in a lot of cases, not B two C. So although there are a ton of brands that people recognize as manufacturers like Nike or P and G or Ford, so it's not that you don't know about the companies, but like manufacturing itself is a hidden industry. And I think for a while it, it did get a little bit archaic in ways and, and wasn't adopting leading edge technologies and things like that. But I, I think times have shifted and manufacturing is becoming, you know, digital and, and leading edge and, and adopting some pretty exciting technologies. And it's also offering some more flexible positions from like a work-life balance. Again, I think if you're a young college kid that, you know, likes the idea of living in, you know, San Francisco or New York or somewhere, there's big opportunities, lots of people. And there's, those aren't heavy manufacturing markets per se, but I think you're seeing manufacturing in general diversify from a geography standpoint because the ability to embrace remote workforce. And I think you're seeing so much more being able to be done from home or be done remotely. So. And I, th I think if I were to go back, I, I would 100% jump back into manufacturing. I think it's a, a very exciting industry. It has a huge impact on people's lives and, and the global economy and, and sustainability and, and all sorts of things. So I think it's exciting, but I think there's a myth that it's not as exciting as, as it yeah. is. Yeah, you're, you're right. But we're stomping all over that on this podcast. And just hearing people like you, your stories, your passion, what really drives you. If, if you can't hear that, folks, really coming through, you're missing it. So it's a fun, exciting field, and thanks for sharing that. And so far, it's fun and exciting. Let's talk about when you're having that moment at work and where you're really, you're crushing it, you're doing what you want to do, you're happy, you're getting fulfillment. 
What are you doing in those moments? Yeah, I think it always comes back to, I think Harvard did a study, I think it was the only study that was truly successful at determining like what really drives human happiness and what came out of it was human connection and developing human connection and in-depth human connection. And that's why I like having a job where I get to work with people on a regular basis. And and for me, it comes back to, again, my interest in engineering and helping people solve problems. I guess that's what puts a smile on my face and helping people innovate and take their manufacturing operations to the next level is fun for me. It's exciting. And I think beyond that, I, I think also like helping drive diversity in the industry. A lot of Fortune 500 companies are white male dominated. And I've found a lot of value and joy in, in helping to drive the inclusive culture uh, and improve the diversity and, and the types of people that are attracted or are working in the industry. Right. Great that you're supporting that and, and helping that out. I, we actually got connected through one of the guests on the Women in Engineering series that we had. She led me to you. So thank you, for, Linda, if you're listening to, to this conversation, thank you for making that connection for us. And it sounds like you, you have a lot of fulfillment, Brandon. So that's really good. La- last question on a career, then we'll take a, a, a turn off and go down a personal road. But from a career standpoint, any highlights, anything you'd like to share that really stands back and you, you look back and say, man, that was really awesome and I had a part of that? Yeah. I'd like to think there's a lot of things that I could point to, whether it's driving big sales numbers or significantly impacting a manufacturing operations as far as increasing throughput or quality or something like that. But I think the moment that I guess touched me the most was, I think, as I just said, I have taken a, a pride or passion in getting involved in the inclusion side. And I was recognized, I think, two years ago for what, what's called Wi-Fi Ally of the Year Award which basically means the women at Rockwell, which Rockwell is a 23,000 person company. I'm not sure how many women, but there's definitely a lot of them. And this is specific to women in the field. So women in sales, but basically saying that I was the ally of the year for them, a person that's an advocate, a person that's helping them drive change, improve their experience at Rockwell. And for me, that was a highlight because it's hard to do. And I think it's exciting to hear that you're making a difference in people's lives and, and making their career more enjoyable. For me, that was, that was a highlight. Well, man, congratulations on that. That's, that's wonderful. So, so you know, thank you for sharing that with our listeners. It's definitely an important topic, something we need to be talking about with everyone in the industry. Again, congratulations on that, man. And so now we get to turn our hats around backwards, get outside of work, get out of sight of this smart manufacturing industry 4.0 stuff that, you know, confuses some people, but we're very passionate about. And let's talk about you outside of work, man. What do you, what do you enjoy doing for fun? Yeah, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I would call Salt Lake a, a hidden secret of the world. It is the mecca for outdoor sports. I'm big into outdoor sports, so whether it's mountain biking, skiing, or snowboarding, or wakeboarding, or or hiking, all, all sorts of things. It is mecca here for outdoor activities. So I, I'm definitely an enthusiast of anything that gets your adrenaline going up. Okay. Very cool, man. How about from a family standpoint, anything you'd like to share with us there? Yeah, I come from a small family, one sister, uh, mom and mom and dad. They're all up in, in Washington. My dad is in construction. My mom's a dental hygienist. I'm definitely thankful for them as parents and, and the foundation and, and work ethic and just overall positivity that they instilled in me. So definitely love my parents. And my sister's a counselor up there, and she's one of the people that I would say inspired me the most to get involved in like the inclusion efforts that I've done. Because she's working at that every day in a lot of different communities, whether it's the LGBTQ communities or just different minority groups. So she's definitely a, a service hero in helping young children from a counseling perspective. So shout out to her for sure. That's awesome. So how often do you get to go up to Washington and see everybody? I try to get up there quite a bit. Travel's definitely been limited with the COVID situation, but I was up there a couple months ago, but definitely for the holidays. And with my age, it's definitely wedding season every year for my friends. So that's usually a good excuse to get back up there. Right. I hear you. Okay. So outside in Salt Lake City, you're saying it's a lot of fun stuff. So do you enjoy hiking more or biking? You threw them all together, but if you had to rank them, how would you rank that? I would say I'm a big fan of mountain biking for sure, although it recently hasn't been good to me. I uh, 
crashed last weekend and ended up with nine stitches. There's always the downside to the sports, but I'm a huge fan of mountain biking. It's a very fun activity, uh, great way to get exercise and go explore exciting new places. Okay. Now I'm not never done mountain biking. So give us some, uh, a breakdown. What type of equipment do you want? Do you, is there, are there any bikes or things that you put as a, important when you want to start looking to, to do that? Yeah, there's tons of options out there. You can spend as little or as much as you want. You know, I would say full suspension bicycles are, are pretty common in mountain biking. It's shifted as far as the tire size from 26 to 29 to 27.5. I think 29 is, is the most popular now. And now you're seeing a shift towards e-bikes. I actually just got a, an e-mountain bike, which... <laughs> is somewhat of a faux pas in the mountain bike community because I think they they naturally are a fan of self-propulsion, not a dirt bike. But the e-bikes are pretty cool. They You still get a really good workout and uh, you still have to pedal, but it just allows you to go farther, go faster, go tackle more difficult terrain. You know, I think it's I think it's fun and exciting. So what's a, what's a price point just as a reference for an e-bike to, to get going? It's not, it's not a good one. It's, it's like... Probably minimum two to three grand, and you can spend the top end of the model I just got it is actually like 16 grand, which is crazy. I did not spend anywhere near that, but yeah, you can spend as much as you want on a bike for sure. See, oh, so we just come from different worlds. If I'm spending, if I spend 16 on a bike, it better have Harley written on the side of it, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but there I know, it's, it's crazy. I would say an average good mountain bike is in that two to five thousand dollar range. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, it sounds like you're having a lot of fun with it. That's awesome that you get to to enjoy that where you're at there in Utah. How about, you know, last question before we get to the why. Any podcasts, YouTube channels, books, any resources that you consume that you really enjoy? Yeah. So a couple books I'll throw out for folks from a sales perspective. The Compelling Communicator is a good one. It's all about how to land, how to powerfully land a small number of big ideas. I think a, a legendary one that will always stand the test of time is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, a really great one. And then more recently, reading Align to Achieve, which is really around a coordinated strategy across sales, marketing, and customer success. Uh, big fan of the Joe Rogan podcast as far as a variety of different things. And then Manufacturing Happy Hour, my good friend chris lukey runs that as you and uh, i think he's doing some exciting stuff there yeah chris does a great job and we definitely like uh, what he's doing in manufacturing happy hour so man that's awesome we'll put some of those references out in the show notes for the listeners so they can point out to that and brandon we call it eco s y we always wrap up with the why you know, and this just talks about passion and what you what really drives you so if you had to answer that what is your personal why yeah I think I talked earlier to the number one thing that ties to happiness is human connection. And to go along with that, I've always been interested and excited by technology and innovation. So for me, my why is, is helping people combine the two together to make the world a better place, whether it's driving energy sustainability or reducing our, our footprint, or making more with less when it comes from a manufacturing standpoint, and really driving and expanding my human connections as I do it. That's what gets me up every day. That's what gets me excited. How can I, how can I go help people apply technology to, to make improvements and make the world a better place? You're doing a great job. Inspiration to us all. Definitely one of our heroes. Thank you for taking the time with us today on Eco SY, Brandon. This has been a lot of fun to get to learn a little bit more about you. And I just really appreciate, again, your time supporting us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris, for having me on. You're doing some exciting stuff here, and thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S. -S 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 -S